Okay, in this example, we're going to be looking at the effect of evaporation um, on a, a system. And the example this time will be treating hypothermia. Um, my dad did ski patrol for years, and one of the main health issues that he had to deal with was people who had managed to get wet and cold on the slopes and um, were going into hypothermia or at risk of going into hypothermia. So hypothermia um, is something that they talk about occurring when your body temperature goes um, below 35 degrees Celsius, where normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So you're just a couple degrees Celsius cold. Um, and there's a number of steps that they go through while they call for medical assistance, an ambulance. Um, and let's sort of talk through some of those. So we have a person and they're cold. There's a, inside there's a metabolism that's providing heat. Now part of the problem is they're not generating enough heat, but that metabolism can go into a couple places. It can go to increase body temperature. But it can go to, to other factors. Some of it is lost to the environment. So radiative loss, just cold air. Um, it can be lost to uh, several things here. So evaporation of water on your skin, as well as just radiative loss. And that evaporation um, becomes a big problem if you're wet. So the, the water in the coat evaporates. Now you're thinking it's snow, it's really cold, it's not evaporating. Keep in mind your clothes are right next to your body. So anything that keeps your clothes cold um, is a problem. So your body heat's going in there. The body heat is transferring into the water in a, a wet garment, um, leading to evaporation. So the, the question we'll look at this time is how much heat can um, water evaporating from a wet t-shirt removed from your body, and how does that compare um, to your body temperature increase? So we're just looking at the transfer from metabolism to body temp and then sort of parallel the transfer of metabolism to evaporation. The increased body temperature, we'll do a Q is M, C sub S delta T. It won't be perfect, but we'll just assume you're a big bag of water. And for the evaporation, we're going to need a, a heat of vaporization. And the heat of vaporization is 2.44 um, kilojoules per gram of water. Okay, and so if we know how much water is evaporating, not kilograms, sorry, kilojoules. If we know how much water is evaporating in grams, we know how much heat that takes. So I'm going to make a couple assumptions. I'm going to assume that this t-shirt is wet because it has 100 grams of water on it. Now, that may actually be low depending on the type of t-shirt, um, but let's treat it as 100 grams of water for this example. Um, and so it's pretty wet, it's not just damp. Okay, and the body temperature, well, sort of depends on whose body, but let's just, for round numbers, assume it's somebody that weighs 200 pounds. And pounds isn't terribly useful, so we're gonna need to change that body weight um, into grams. And 200 pounds ends up being 9.07 times 10 to the 4 grams, approximately. We have our, our mass of water, and so I think we're looking at two systems. We want to calculate the heat from the evaporation, and then stick that in to the heat for the warming the body. The heat for warming the body will be a Q is M, C sub S delta T, but we're interested in solving for the change in temperature. So we'll stick that in there. For the evaporation, to get to heat, we're going to start with grams of water and then go to joules of water, or joules of heat, for the water um, by using that heat of vaporization. So we'll go ahead and we'll put in the 9.07 times 10 to the 4 grams. Oh, see, that's the bot body. 
you need the 100 grams of water. And each gram of water requires 2.44 kilojoules. One kilojoule is a thousand five grams joules. And so I got 2.44 times 10 to the 5 joules. And this heat we want to compare. That's how much heat's required to evaporate the water. We want to stick that in down there. So 2.44 times 10 to the 5 joules. And the mass this time is that 9.07 times 10 to the 4 grams of body weight. And it's probably not a great assumption, but it's probably within 10%. Just say we're a bag of water. And when you punch all these numbers in, um, I came out with 0 0.6429 degrees Celsius, probably one sig fig, or about one degree Fahrenheit. Now, if you think about that, if we're only off by two, that's about 33% of the heat that we need to keep to get the body up to temperature. So that does make sense. This sort of mathematical quick approximation does sort of indicate that if you have wet clothing on, that's a major factor to you being able to get your body up to, to room temperature. It significantly cuts the heat. It turns out, it's interesting, you can go through and try this, that's a much bigger factor than simply warming up that 100 grams of water. Remember, we were talking about warming up almost 100,000 grams of water. Um, adding 100 to that isn't a, a big percentage. It's the phase change that's the, the big problem. Now, this was for first responders while they wait for the ambulance to get there, but the big things my dad taught me would get the person out of the cold, that makes sense. Get rid of wet clothing, replace it with, um, you know, warm blankets or something dry. Apply warm, dry compresses. Often this is in the form of water bottles wrapped in towels. Um, something to transfer the heat. This turns out to be a little bit smaller as far as quantity of energy involved. And then give warm drinks, sort of warm them up from the inside. But this wet clothing is clearly a major factor in um, the heat. The other thing is in these drinks, um, Dad used to say lots of sugar or honey or, or something with um, calories um, to give your body some energy to start um, your metabolism back up and chocolate because chocolate's high in fat and sugar and good source of calories. So this in this example, we used a mathematical model to just sort of check and point out that removing wet clothing can have a major impact on your body's ability to warm up.